Hey y'all, what's up? Jamie, that's me here. Welcome back to the channel, honey. Welcome back to another conversation regarding Real Housewives of Potomac, okay? Today, um, I want to talk to you guys about this particular article that I've been seeing floating around over on Twitter. Um, and it's, it was written by um, Essence Magazine, okay? Someone at Essence Magazine, and we'll get into that once we get into the article. And it's regarding, like I say, Real Housewives of Potomac and breaking the fourth wall. Um, I've been seeing it floating around on Twitter where I've seen some people that are in full support of the article and then you have quite a few people that are not in full support of everything in the article okay so as I started to read the article I say you know what let me wait because I actually want to make sure that I am indeed you know reading the article with y'all so that we can have our own conversation about it over here on um youtube um so yeah make sure that you guys are coming into the video you are liking the video um and you're also subscribing to the channel okay make sure that you guys are supporting me in that way i do appreciate it okay so we're about to go ahead and we're about to pull up this article so that we all can really get into some things and see exactly what they're trying to say about Real Housewives of Potomac. Now, before we get into that, I have seen some things on Twitter swarming around where they're saying that one of the uh, producers, Eric Fuller, um, people are alleging that Eric was fired from um, Bravo um, and he's not going to be working on Real Housewives of Potomac. Um, and that maybe the reason why Real Housewives of Atlanta is in limbo, maybe they're not just looking for cast members, but they're also looking for a new production team as well, possibly. Now, this is just things that I've seen on Twitter. I don't think anything has truly been confirmed just yet. What I have seen from um, different screenshots was uh, people saying that Eric had been looking for a new job per LinkedIn saying, hey, I'm looking for a new opportunity. So what's going on? So people are believing that, you know, with the rumors being out there of him being fired, in addition to going to his LinkedIn and saying that he is indeed looking for a job, they're believing that he won't be working on Real Housewives um, work anymore. But I don't know, because I'm thinking that, you know, sometimes when you're in between productions, um, he could just be looking for another opportunity at this time. Not that he's completely fired and won't be working over there. Um, on those platforms. I'm not sure, but it's just a thought of mine um, because Real Housewives of Potomac has already filmed and then you have Real Housewives of Atlanta that has yet to start filming. It is a bit delayed. So maybe because Real Housewives of Atlanta is delayed, that could be the reason as to why um, he wanted to find a new opportunity. Now, I don't know if this is something that he typically does, you know, from the past when shows are delayed or whatever. Um, but, I, you know, I was just kind of wondering if Maybe that could be the reason, you know, I will say this from my understanding. I thought that he was good friends with Carlos King. So I'm sure Carlos probably got some other opportunities and projects that he could slide you on if you're in need of, you know, a gig or something like that. So we'll just have to wait and see. Not sure if he's officially fired or if he's just in between productions at this time and he needs a new opportunity, which is also interesting within itself, because what if you take on an opportunity that's going to be quite a few months? And then once Real Housewives of Atlanta gets the go to start filming, are you going to be able to leave that production and go back to Housewives of Atlanta? So with those type of questions, I can understand a person feeling like, oh, no, nah, uh -uh, that don't even make sense. He's definitely fired because why would you take on another opportunity? knowing that at any moment production could get started for, you know, Real Housewives of Atlanta. So we'll just have to wait and see. Either way, good luck. Hopefully things work out, you know, in his favor, ultimately. And also, let me say this, as we're getting into the article, as we get into this article and the way that people are saying Essence Magazine and their writer has read the hell out of Potomac, people are also using this article as another way to, you know, validate the fact that Eric has indeed been fired based on, you know, what is being called out in this particular article. Um, I can't say that the two go together, but Anywho, all right, like I said, good luck. And we're going to go ahead and tap into this article just to see exactly what's being said here, all right? Um, first things first, like I said, make sure you guys are liking up the video and supporting the channel with subscriptions. Thank you guys so much. Now, so they're saying, breaking the fourth wall, Real Housewives of Potomac. Though the inclusion of Aneka might be seen as a positive step towards representation of darker-skinned Black women on screen, the conflict between... Wendy and Ineka highlights a more profound issue. 
Mm, so let's get into this. Girl, let me tell y'all something. I well, This is what I'm thinking to myself. <laughs> As I'm looking at this article, the fact that they use this photo of Ineka center screen with her mouth wide open the way that she has it leads me to believe that this is not going to be a good article in favor of her. And again, I have not read the article at all. I'm just looking like, girl, out of all of the images for Potomac and Ineka, why did y'all use this one with her being the center of the photo with her mouth wide open, child? But let's go ahead <laughs> and let's, uh, let's get into it, all right? So they're saying among all the Real Housewives franchises, Potomac gained its claim to fame through its two matriarchal anchors and that's karen huger and giselle bryant while like many of well here's the thing two matriarchal um was karen that girl like that was she that girl like that i would think that um the head would would have been well i guess i mean she is older when you say matriarchal you know i mean giselle is older but she's younger than karen but the head of the girls, I think it was originally Giselle Bryant, you know, and then Karen came along at a later time and she became that girl. So I don't know. Maybe they're saying that because Karen deemed herself as the grand dame in the very beginning or whatever. So maybe that's why. But anywho, let's keep going. First of all, I want to make sure that we say this article was written by Shelby Stewart. OK, um, but let's get into more. So. They're saying, or she'll be saying, while like many of his counterparts, Potomac is recognized for depicting the lifestyles and interpersonal dynamics of women, Real Housewives of Potomac has become somewhat lackluster in offering a compelling glimpse into the lives of the ladies of Potomac, Maryland. However, beneath the surface lies a deeper issue. So let's get to this deeper issue. They're saying now in its eighth season, the show has mostly stayed with the same cast with the scattering of replacements and additions with Monique Samuels joining in season two, Candace Dillard Bassett joining in season three, Dr. Wendy Osefo in season five, and Mia Thornton in season six. Outside of some of the newly minted friends and housewives, the show's anchors have mostly remained the same. First of all, I forgot because I, I actually I can't even recall Monique coming before Candace. I don't know why I thought they they came around the same time. But I guess that is so. I, I think that Monique may have. Yeah, I don't think Candace was around uh, when Giselle was dating Sherman in the beginning. So I think maybe Monique did come before Candace. Okay. Anywho. All right, so they're saying Dr. Wendy Osefo in season five and Mia Thornton in season six. Outside of some of the newly minted friends and housewives, the show's anchors have mostly remained the same, which is Karen Huger, um, Giselle Bryant, Robin Dixon, Sharice Jackson, Jordan, who is an our friend of the show, Ashley Darby, and Katie Ross, who we miss, okay? They're saying Katie Ross, who was fired after season one and brought back for season one. Four, okay, I can't remember how many seasons Miss Katie has done officially, but y'all need to give Katie another season, child. Bring Katie on back, all right? They say the franchise has been on a sharp decline for some time now, mostly due to the un uninspiring storylines of most of the cast, okay? Coupled with the pervasive ha hazing combined with an undercurrent of colorism and blatant unfairness has made the show increasingly harder to watch, all right? Potomac has a history of using a bait and switch tactic, deliberately provoking and isolating women within the group only to subsequently label these women as aggressive. Now, listen, I do agree with this statement um, because the only person I'm thinking about is Candace Diller Bassett. Okay. And I feel like they're doing it in this very season as we're watching it, as we're watching this very show right now, bait and switch is robbing for me, bait and switch tactic. Well, really it's, it's giving um, Ashley ass like to do that a whole lot, but I'm thinking Robin bait and switch because she likes to act like she's the victim and everybody's doing everything to her. And then when they try to have conversations, what was me? She don't want to talk about the shit. Okay. And then you sit up there, you come at, you support 
Giselle and her BS when it comes to Chris. And then when Candace calls you out about it and then you withheld your own storyline, bitch, it is giving bait and switch because now you want to sit up here and have an issue with Candace because you feel like Candace was talking about you in interviews when you've been talking shit on your own podcast. Girl, what? Deliberately provoking. That is Ashley. That is Ashley. Isolating women within the group. I feel like Giselle going to Robin telling Robin to not talk to Candace at all. Um, is a form of her wanting to isolate Candace from the group only to subsequently label these women as aggressive. So when Candace snaps off on you hoes, y'all gonna feel like, oh, she's acting aggressive. She's this, she's that. Especially Miss Ashley, which old provoking and everything. Girl, you are so annoying. But anywho, they go on to say it first reared his head in season five when the quote unquote green eyed bandits, Brian and, and Dixon, led a crusade against Samuels. Now, first of all, and I see that right there. I'm gonna have to, I don't know about that part. You over here talking about led a crusade. Who the hell? Ain't nobody have to lead a crusade against her at all. Um, what is giving is that that happened on, on its own because that's what Monique wanted. Okay. Um, Monique did that to herself in my personal. So what do you mean? Led a crusade against Samuels. They already didn't like her ass. So her getting into that with um, Candace, knowing that Candace wasn't even the main person she had to beef with. But I guess she saw Candace as the weakest person. So that's why she attacked her in my personal. But I just feel like um, she did like what they wanted her to do. She did exactly what them girls wanted her to do. You should know if they don't like you, they're going to do anything to like to get you up off the show. But if y'all also remember that season, uh, Monique had sat down with Giselle at some point. She said she was trying to form a damn friendship with Giselle. She let Giselle come over her house, you know, bring up a trainer or whatever slick shit she was trying to do. You let Giselle ride with you over there to y'all house when y'all had stayed at the lake house or whatever the case was. Like, so ain't nobody really lead a crusade. If anybody led it, I feel like Monique led this shit on her own because she was the one that was trying to befriend the GEBs in my personal and then come up against your own friend, Miss Candace, for who and for what. For who and for what? And the whole time Candace was telling her the whole season she didn't want no issue with her. So, girl, what? But you still wanted the issue with Candace for whatever fucking reason. And I, I can't even remember what the reason was, but I feel like when we found out, it wasn't even that deep for her to come at that lady. You should have been coming at the woman that was trying to accuse you of messing around with somebody else and alleging that your child was not your husband. It's like, that's who you should have been coming for. So all of that, I can't say that GEB's led a crusade against Monique. Nah, Monique did this to herself. Well, let's keep going. Who physically attacked, you know, uh, you know, Candace and um, drummed up rumors about Samuels and her family. Correct. See, y'all just said it right here. Okay. It first. It was it first reared his head in season five when the GEBs led a crusade against Samuels and drummed up rumors about Samuels and her family. OK, so that's ain't nobody lead no crusade. She did this shit on her own. She should have saw what was coming up, what was going on. Though Samuels left the show following season five, her resounding words have seemed to foreshadow the direction of the franchise's future. Let's get into it. Now, following Mia Thornton's assault on a Wendy Ocefo in season seven, where Mia splashed a martini in Wendy's face, Samuels came forward with commentary about her former castmates. One thing Wendy should understand is that it's not about her actions or lack thereof. She could have sat there quietly and they still would have found reason to ice her out. Um, she ain't lying. The same ladies who told me words or even antagonizing someone is not grounds for getting physical or defending a person who got physical over Peter Thomas, LOL, just wow. Now I have to agree with that portion. Um, I do think that that was messed up to heavily come for uh, Monique when they got into it, you know, when she got into it with Candace or whatever and not have that same stance because y'all don't like Wendy, right? If it was wrong when Monique do it, because I still stand by the fact that it was wrong when she did it. It also was damn sure wrong with Wendy. And what I need y'all to stop doing is to stop acting like Mia only threw a drink in Wendy's face. When in my personal, she also hit that lady with her purse. So are we just going to forget that part too? 
So, yeah, the bitch was out of, out of line. And there was absolutely nothing, in my opinion, that Wendy said that really warranted those actions of Mia. Mia, you had been doing slick shit. How do you do slick things and say, say slick things and expect a person not to respond to you in the same fashion? Like, it just, it, it doesn't make sense. So, I was team Wendy on any and everything that she had to say to you. You, my dear, were completely out of line for how you responded and the fact that the geb sat there said nothing completely supported her behavior robin picked up her phone filmed it filmed her filmed this altercation or shall i say this assault happened on her co-star and then you over there telling wendy to stop antagonizing the bitch that hit her like you ain't been sitting around this whole season seeing how Mia has acted with Wendy, the audacity. And this is the very reason why for me, I don't give a fuck about nothing going on with Robin this season. I don't give a fuck about one embarrassing her down to the national television. I do not care about her seeking sympathy for anything because you were disgusting last season. You were disrespectful as hell last season. And you think that we supposed to sit here and give a damn this season about you crying, sitting on the curb. No, I'm going to care about as much as Juan cares and he doesn't. So therefore, I don't either. OK, good luck. Now, let's keep going, honey. Let's keep going. The glaring issue on Potomac is seemingly that the goalpost always moves depending on who you're talking to. I think that is a very accurate statement. Hell, Candace already told y'all the line is always moving. The line is always moving. and she didn't lie. All right. So they go on to say during season five, the women largely condemned Monique for attacking Candace. But during the season seven reunion, when the altercation between Wendy and Mia was addressed, it was radio silence among the women, with the exception of Ashley, Karen and Candace. This consensus was largely attributed to the evident animosity towards Wendy. And that's what's killing me softly. So let me finish this sentence. Brian openly stated, I don't like her in reference to Wendy. <sighs> Giselle, I feel like the, the energy that you're giving to Wendy and to Candace is not even half the energy that you gave to Monique. And when I say that, I'm talking about you did an action that caused a reaction. And it was a reaction from Wendy. You did something to Candace. She reacted. And you also did something to Monique. And Monique reacted. But I also feel like the energy you're meeting them with, you didn't even necessarily meet Monique with. Yeah, you didn't like Monique, but you still were at a place where you probably could have a conversation. Now you're at a place where you can't even have a conversation with Wendy. Or Candace, why is that? And ain't nobody else gonna tell me nothing different. The reason why, and I said this before, is because of the colorism conversation. And Giselle does not like the fact that those ladies have introduced that into this show, causing certain people to be held accountable for their actions. And she doesn't like the fact that she could potentially be labeled as a colorist. And of course, she's going to use her token dark skin ex ex husband. Um, as a means to say, I'm not colorist. See, I dated this dark skinned black man. Da, 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 da. Go away from us with that. I don't even think that counts. OK, that's just like a white person saying I'm not racist. See, my my friend over here is black. Like, girl, move on. But anywho, I just find that to be very interesting. Like you try to insinuate Wendy getting changes done to her body could be because her husband is possibly cheating or interested in cheating on her. And when she drags you for trying to come in, come in between her marriage in any capacity, you don't like her now because you couldn't handle her response. You thought that you were supposed to say whatever you wanted to say, and then she's supposed to just let it ride. Same thing with Ken. Did you try to come in between her marriage? I feel insinuating that her husband made you feel uncomfortable, this and that. But every time we asked you, what did he do? You sat up there and said he didn't do anything. I just felt uncomfortable. Well, what the fuck made you feel uncomfortable? Then you turn around this season and try to say he made you go into a room. Like, just saying this outlandish, weird-ass shit. So when Candace pounces on you again at the reunion, you're going to be mad even more. So that's what I don't be understanding. Because you do something, people react. Now you don't like them, and then now you don't want to have any conversation with them. 
that's not how it should work in the show. And not only do I blame um, Giselle, I blame production for making her think that this is okay. You know, um, y'all gonna have to rework some stuff. And it's like y'all letting the cast members run y'all instead of y'all running the cast members. Y'all, these people signed up. I'm, girl, let me just, my mind is starting to drift because I'm over here thinking, you know, about people that be withholding their tea, like Robin or whatever. Y'all signed up to give y'all lives on this show. If you don't want to give your entire life when a producer steps in and says, hey, let's talk about this and that. And you'd be like, we ain't talking about that or whatever. I'm now I'm thinking about Candy Birds a little bit. But it's like, if you don't want to talk about it, then we, we need to get you up off the show then. Because y'all signed up to have conversations. Now, how you choose to talk about it is on you. You could talk about it in a way where we don't, they don't get nothing out of it. But you still need to talk about it. And when I want also, I want to also say that I'm thinking about how um, Giselle should be forced to have a sit down with Wendy to have the conversation instead of going around her. At some point, Giselle should be forced to have that sit down with Candace. Instead of going around her, like she shouldn't be able to operate in a in a season where she's not interacting with her other castmates all because she, quote unquote, don't like them. So people be at work every day having to work with bitches they don't like people they don't like. And y'all get paid way more than a lot of these people in these corporate offices having to deal with a manager or a team member that they don't damn like. Come on now. So absolutely not. I blame some of production because y'all sitting up here letting these people do that. And when you set the tone for that, you set the tone for the audience to not fuck with or like your show, which is the reason why y'all are in hot water now, because the people ain't even interested like they used to be. I feel like people watch it and they talk about it because it ain't shit else going on. If it was another reality show at the same time as Potomac and it was good, girl, nobody would be watching Potomac at all. But let's go ahead and keep going. All right. Um, Shelby goes on to say the ousting has become a pattern and is orchestrated by the GEB who have maneuvered through much of the show's past seasons without having to reveal much of their own personal lives and pivoting the focus on the other women and stirring up drama. Now, I will say not so much as Robin when it comes to the GEB in my personal. Um, so when you say orchestrated by the GEB who have maneuvered through much of the show's past seasons without having to reveal much of their own personal lives, that's not necessarily true for Robin. I feel like Robin has talked about her taxes. Um, Robin has talked about a lot of stuff. We've seen, you know, with her business, we've seen her and Juan get into it about different things. Like, I feel like Robin has given us something. The most Giselle has given, given us is seeing Jamal through the phone and whatever she got going on with her daughters. She doesn't give us her real life. And again, I blame production. Now, I don't know if it's favoritism or if it's colorism. Sometimes there is favoritism within that colorism, but I don't know which one they're choosing. But it's like, I don't think nobody else could get away with that. I don't think anyone could get away with that. So why is it y'all have allowed for so long for Giselle to get away? Karen can't even get away with that. Karen has even told us things that's been going on in her marriage, whether her and Ray were struggling because Ray don't love her his tax situations, she having to move, whatever's going on with her family, like um, Surrey County. What is Giselle giving us? It's been a while since we've gotten anything from Giselle. And so, um, yeah, but I think Robin has given us more. It's just the problem that this is one of Robin's biggest storylines that she's had while being on this show and her not bringing it up or nobody else bringing it up to talk about it. Yeah, that was messed up. But it's the fact that she sat around waiting for somebody else, just lying. I was waiting for Karen to bring it up. I was waiting for this person to bring it up. You don't have to wait for somebody else to bring up what you're going through in your household. The same way you didn't want to deal, you don't want to deal with it now. That was the exact same thing that was happening last year. And now you're forced to talk about it. And you don't want to talk about it because you don't want to revisit those emotions. Because for you, you think you and one have moved on. But you really haven't. You really haven't, girl. But let's keep going. All right. So Shelby says these attacks appear to be grounded in a pro in projection. Women who enjoy the support of loving husbands, successful careers and supportive families seem to evoke envy from those who do not have those same privileges. Let's face the facts. Giselle is a divorcee from a high profile ex-pastor, ex-pastor Jamal Bryant. 
Robin is grappling with both the financial and marital challenges with her new with her now remarried husband, Juan Dixon. Ashley is navigating a divorce and Mia in recent news has been seen with a new man. That's not her husband, G. It seems like a calculated strategy to marginalize women who exude positivity and possess the qualities others covet. For those who may harbor entitlement due to being fair skinned, witnessing darker skinned black women thriving in every aspect of life can be triggering. OK, mm, interesting. So you're saying that Candace is thriving. Wendy is thriving in her in their lives, you know, as a darker skinned woman. And you're saying that the other ladies could be triggered by that. At least that's how I'm processing that. Um, the statement. Now they go on to say, nevertheless, in an apparent response to the accusations of colorism and everyone choosing sides after Thornton assaulted Wendy, the producers of Potomac made a seemingly concerted effort to introduce a new cast member in NECA who shares Nigerian heritage with the Dr. Wendy Osefo. Um, they go on to say, although the inclusion of Ineka might be seen as a positive step towards a representation of darker skinned black women on screen, the on-screen conflict between Ineka and Wendy highlights a more profound cult cultural problem. One of the major problems that they're having is that they make their ethnicity a big part of their personality. There's nothing wrong with wanting to demonstrate your culture, says content creator and fellow Nigerian Rennie Vaughn. One of the mistakes they're making is that they're making that the central part of their personality. They keep attributing their successes and wealth to being Nigerian, which is where the problem lies. Mm, okay. The ongoing exchange between the two has involved accusations against Wendy's family, labeling them as Osu, a term highly considered derogatory in the African culture. OK, they go on to say in a TED talk, a speaker describes Osu as people who were told and believed dedicated their lives and their services to the community deity and went further to pledge their faithfulness of their generations unborn. Therefore, they belong to the communities. Labeling someone as Osu carries with it institutionalized discrimination and isn't something to be taken lightly in African culture. All right. Now, I initially have to blame um, Ashley, because although there was an article insinuating, insinuating, because that's what it came from. It didn't seem like it was an exchange between both of the ladies. Is this article the same? It was an exchange between both of the ladies, basically labeling Wendy's family as Osu. Um, I didn't get that. I got that a blogger tried to label her as that and Ashley introduced that to the show. And I think that an uneducated producer could have possibly put that bug in Ashley's ear for her to bring that up. And maybe they were educated enough. Um, right. But didn't care how it may harm Wendy and her family. So, of course, Ashley brought it up and NECA tried to explain it. But then at a later time, what we see is in NECA insinuating certain things that could likely make a person believe that the article labeling Wendy and her family as Osu could possibly be true. OK, so she definitely fed into the bullshit for sure. But I don't think that she initially started that conversation. So I feel like. We got to pull Ashley into that because Ashley introduced it on the show, even though she tried to come back and clean it up and apologize or whatever the case is. I still feel like Ashley is to not be trusted, but that's just my personal. OK. Um. All right. So let's 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 um. let's keep going because there is indeed more. Furthermore. The dispute includes implications of witchcraft, shrines, most of which are perpetuating ignorance, xenophobia, and fear-mongering. We have two women who are not only from Nigeria, and they're actually the same ethnicity, and then happen to be experiencing conflict as a result of cultural differences within their ethnicity, which in other words, they're now airing dirty laundry that had no business being aired all the way in America. 
Now, apart from Wendy and Aneka, the women in the group have no knowledge of traditional African religion. Breaking the fourth wall reveals a more significant concern, a storyline tactically orchestrating a conflict between two Igbo women on national television. Reality television thrives on conflict, but the narrative falters when we clumsily attempt to develop into African spirituality on a national stage, okay? It says it calls the showrunners to the carpet for allowing the conversation to happen on camera. It's something very devious about the nature of exposing sensitive cultural discussions without the necessary care and responsibility. It intentionally perpetuates stereotypes and causes harm. The implication that Wendy is Osu is one thing. Secondly, when Aneka accuses Wendy's mom of practicing witchcraft, these are accusations and conflicts that take place in the privacy of the home within the Nigeria in Igbo culture. OK, you are an you are on American television. OK, says Vaughn. You've now taken the responsibility of trying to represent Nigeria when nobody asked you. It's a heavy burden to carry, quite frankly. OK. Mm -mm. To bring Osu claims to television among a group of women who hardly get along in the first place, most of whom don't like Wendy, as an extra layer of insensitivity. It not only magnifies existing conflicts, but also exploits cultural um, details. Let me look this up because I'm like, what is that word? Because I've never heard that one before. I don't think I have. Okay. Um, oh, intricate. Okay, gotcha. Uh, for dramatic effect. Okay. They say Vaughn, who is currently in Nigeria for the holidays, says it's strange for people to tune into American television and see that this is a plot. Okay. Um, I definitely agree with that. I was already calling the producers out or whoever's a part of production that would even allow such conversation to come to the front. I feel like they definitely were ignorant or lacked knowledge of you know, um, the Nigerian culture and things. And I also was wondering, or did they know? Maybe they're not as ignorant as I'm thinking and they still utilize that as an opportunity to pin these two ladies against each other. At least, you know, that's what I'm thinking. But let's keep going. They're saying among the storylines presented over the show's eight seasons, none have generated as much controversy and drama as the recent feud between Wendy and Ineka. What's even more perplexing is the missed opportunity to explore other noteworthy topics that could be uh, peppered into the show, like Ineka's family life. Y'all, that is so true because we still do not know a goddamn thing about Ineka. Have not seen her husband in a few episodes. We just know she wants to get pregnant. She says she's an attorney, but we never see her at work. So I'm like, girl, what? Or either she's a lawyer, one of the two, but we never see her at work. OK, now they go on to say that they could be talking about Ineka's family's life, Wendy's new talk show. Um, both Wendy, a doctor of philosophy, and Ineka, who's a lawyer, had the potential to showcase their affluent and opulent lifestyles or joining forces, particularly as Igbo women. Unfortunately, this discourse has become the show's central storyline, overshadowing the opportunity to highlight their achievements okay um also can i just add that when it comes to production i'm wondering if anybody on production is not a fan of wendy for y'all to even introduce the whole osu storyline by having ashley bring it up on camera um and all I, i'm i'm just wondering that because not only because of the osu comments but this was an opportunity for y'all to show these two Nigerian ladies in a great light. And is y'all instead y'all focused on the conversation of people thinking that Wendy wanted to be the only Nigerian woman on the show. So it's like, did, did y'all want them to go at it? Like Wendy has enough people coming at her when it comes to Giselle and Robin. Why did y'all feel the need to bring in another person for that to happen? Like, I don't know, child. It's just, child, let's keep going. 
The insinuations surrounding Wendy's family lack tact and discussing them on national television lacks the discretion that the African community deserves. This cultural debate, if you can even call it that, necessitates a conversation that is both delicate and, delicate and nuanced. The socioeconomic and political implications of such a claim are not suited for a platform like Real Housewives. They're in such an awkward fight because they're having a fight where you're throwing heavy accusations that are considered taboo within the culture. If you accuse someone of witchcraft, that is really a big deal, says Vaughn. People freak out. It's not something to be taken lightly, and people are very insulted by it. Nigeria is a very religious country. Both women are Catholic slash Christian. To accuse someone of witchcraft is like, dang, you hate them. It calls into question how in tune with the culture they both are. For that to be the storyline for a show about lighthearted drama where they normally argue about having four homes or your living room doesn't look good or who got Botox, then to speak about witchcraft and being from a caste system, that is just irresponsible and they should know better. Um, when you say they should know better, um, for me, I hope you're talking about production. And also, I hope that you're talking about Ineka because I don't think Wendy did anything wrong aside from trying to defend her damn family. So when you say they should know better, who are you talking about? Vaughn. OK, but let's keep going. Unfortunately, this is not the first instance during the season seven reunion. This unfortunately, this is not the first instance during the season seven reunion when Dillard Bassett, Miss Candace, addressed colorism. None of the cast members were adequately equipped to engage in the conversation. Correct. However, for such a conversation to land on a platform like Housewives speaks to a larger issue with the cast and production. Before Monique was ousted in season six, she brought forth claims of the women conspiring to come after her and fabricate storylines. And what's happening to Wendy feels vaguely similar. I told her at the season five reunion that she and her family would be next, Samuel said in the post. The hate with some of these women is not for the camera. They're real life miserable. Okay. This is what Miss um, Monique told Wendy. And Wendy indeed was next, I do believe. Real Housewives of Potomac has shed light on the pitfalls of exploiting sensitive cultural topics for entertainment. The recklessness with which these claims have been brought to the forefront among a group of women already struggling to find common ground raising questions about the responsibility of showrunners and its ethics of how to move forward Vaughn says I think there needs to be admission that it went too far I think they can't address this how they talk about regular beef it can't be a discussion of is Juan talking to the laundromat girl or does Karen have an extra boyfriend because that's too light Vaughn says they have to understand that by this storyline we've actually insulted a whole culture. They need to admit and address as a unit that people with ethnic nuances never should have been a focus point for the season. It was a complete mistake to go down that road. Okay. Now they go on, uh, Shelby goes on to say as viewers, it prompts us to reflect on the boundaries between entertainment and cultural sensitivity, urging a more thoughtful approach to storytelling that respects the dignity and nuances of diverse backgrounds. The unresolved tensions and lingering controversies on the show serve as a stark reminder that beyond reality television, real lives and cultures are at stake, demanding a more conscious approach to what we choose to amplify okay so that looks like that is the end of this particular story okay so I think this person did have some some good points I think the only thing that I really disagree with was um making it appear as though Oneka introduced Osu when actually I feel like production brought that on by way of Ashley and also the Monique story feeling like the ladies kind of GEBs kind of you know led some type of something to come against Miss Girl Miss Monique and I'm like nah Monique contributed to that on her own yeah led a crusade um yeah, as though they led a crusade against her. And it's like, nah, Monique kind of did this on her own when it came down to it. She already knew them ladies didn't like her. So for her to go in and try to attack Candace or whatever she did, 
she should have known they definitely were going to use that as grounds to get up off the get her up off the show you know um she thought she had a friend in those ladies at some point and you didn't okay that's just really what is given ultimately at the end of the day. But I just wanted to come to y'all real quick and just go through this article. I know somebody asked me whether or not I got a chance to check it out over on Twitter. And, you know, I was like, yeah, but I wanted to make sure that I come and I read it with you guys and we share our thoughts, comments, opinions, and all of that. Some of y'all may have read it solo dolo. So just leave your thoughts and comments down below. Let me know how you're feeling about the season. I haven't watched it yet. You know, I'm going to be doing that. Shout out to my patrons. Um, we're going to get into Real Housewives of Potomac. However, um, I did see some tweets where people was like, girl, this is just going downhill even more. Like it wasn't that entertaining or that great of an episode. But, you know, we'll check it out and see. Y'all already know how I felt about last week's episode. It was given every bit of fucking trash. OK, every bit of trash. But we'll check it out see what it's given make sure you guys are like up the video support the channel subscribe all of that great stuff i thank you guys so much for watching or shall i say listening um i am jamie that's me you're welcome to follow me over on instagram or twitter at jamie that's me and until then i'll catch you guys in the next one Bye bye King of my city and cul de sac. Come and I swing like soldier rat. Leading my people like quarterback. But I study this shit, I'm an almanac. Had to get up and grind. Knowledge is booming, I'm here to apply. Came with the chip and the dip, it just single the mile. We finna do more to survive. I need my check. Finna the block for the gouda, we hitting the jeweler to flood out the net. We don't do beef for computers, I'm straight out the sewer, we come and you rest. Niggas be looking perplexed, so keeping my foot on their neck. No map, I trust my gut for the quest. With drama, I'm fully oppressed. I was ready for years and they died of me. All of a sudden, they tell me they proud of me. I've been dropping these haters like calories. Cross my mind, came back with some batteries. Stand for my honor, but you run no corner. Packing the stick with a drummer. Wanna catch my bad one fumble.